Sure. Um, so my name is Jen Carson, and I am in Colchester, Vermont right now, which is right outside of Burlington. Um, but in uh, 2007, I went to the MFA program at the San Francisco Art Institute, um, and I was going there specifically to study sound installation. And um, that's when I got, was introduced to the Arduino and um, and sort of the maker movement that was happening out there because uh, the big the big maker fairs were out there in San Mateo and so went to that event in 2008 got involved with a group called SF microcontrollers after I um, finished my MFA program and really liked it because it was basically this sort of very low-key community group that got together to share information and it was artists and engineers and scientists who worked on uh, creative projects and then would troubleshoot with each other. So it was basically they'd meet in at meet about once a month. They were they were actually pretty casual about it, you know, in terms of it would be whoever really wanted to host one. Um, and then they would show together at things like the Maker Fair. And so when I did come back to Vermont, I was interested in starting something similar here or seeing if there was interest um, and sort of got the opportunity through another event I went to to, to look around and see if there was um, an Arduino user group and there wasn't. And so someone said, well, why don't you start one? And I thought, well, I mean, we can try. And so that's really how the idea started. And um, we got so much interest. It really was a slow build though, um, starting with just sort of maybe five or six people who met really basically online through tweets and through, um, at that point it was just a like a Google user group. Um, but one of the local colleges, Champlain College, contacted us and was interested in what we were doing. And then suddenly we had a venue to be able to do programming and we were interested um, you know, beyond uh, just around the Arduino, but also interested in taking the, the people in, interested in science, engineering, and in the arts and bringing them together. And that is ultimately also how I met John. And from there, we've been building our programming, and we can sort of talk about that throughout the talk, but um, that's how we met John. So I think, John, why don't you Why don't you go take over and tell who you are, John? Sure. Um so I am John. Um, I am. Uh, you put it on. Idea. So I am actually. This is what I really look like. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you. Yes, I. Uh, so I have been at IBM. I'm an, uh, a senior technical person at IBM, just like Michael. Um, I've been at IBM for 31 years, and I'm an IBM fellow, which means I'm old and weird looking. And. Um, <laughs> It has been very interesting. You could appreciate, I don't know what you know about IBM. I, I really do love IBM. It, it is a very linear, you know, get the job done kind of place. But deep in my heart, I've always been more of a nerd than an engineer. And um, one of the things that I really like, I'm also a dad. And I've really enjoyed, especially the weirder I look, the, I've really enjoyed working with the, the public and mostly with kids trying to get them interested in science. So as I did that, I started doing more and more of that while I was trying to pretend to be doing my day job. And um, I've built uh, with partnerships. You, you have to understand that we're in a very rural place. There's, uh, I think, only 600,000 people in the whole state of Vermont. Is that right, Jen? Something and, like, yep. Uh, in our quarter of the state, the northwest quarter, there's about 100,000. And I live in a town of about 600 people. So it's very small. And by the way, it has about the same weather as Stockholm in terms of temperature. You have less sunlight, but we have the same uh, temperature almost, which is it kind, of, kind of interesting. So anyway. It's even colder here in Malmö than in Stockholm. I, I believe that. I believe that. But it's about at least everybody's, uh, we're, we're, we're comfortable when we visit each other. But what happened is uh, I found that the, the state had a very strong uh, maker builder, uh, collaborator ethos. There's a lot of crazy hippies out in the fields that are making good stuff. And so over the years, I've made uh, a seven meter tall robotic pumpkin to scare kids. And I've built a big uh, a seven meter, everything I build is seven meters tall, seven meter tall uh, uh, Ferris wheel car for the Burning Man festival. Do you guys know Burning Man? Oh yeah, yeah, you gotta go to Burning Man. It's a lot like Sweden. Uh, but as I started building things, I was trying to figure out how do I how do I make this more part of my life? And so what I started doing is um, uh, looking for ways of expanding my reach. That took me to do some really strange things. Uh, 2009 and 2010, I was 
part of a Discovery Channel TV show called The Colony, a technical reality show. Uh, the show was really bogus, really crazy, but it was about building things under constraint. But when I came back, I, I was still trying to figure out as I as I head towards, re, you know, retiring from job number one, I, I want to figure out a way of actually spending more time making fun and interactive pieces. And I would never have called them art until, um, oh, I, actually, look, before I before I get to the Vermont makers um, in the about a year ago in the fall of last year, I thought. You know, I, I got very much in love with the maker movement, went to Maker Fair. Jen, I think I was at the same Maker Fair as you. Uh, I didn't know you then. Um, <laughs> in, in San Mateo, I, I go to all of these things and I, I, I have a shop here at my house. And I, I said, you know, we need a couple of these public fab labs. So I reached out to the, um, to the MIT fab lab guys and we started creating a fab lab here at the University of Vermont, where I'm an assistant professor. And uh, so over the, say, six months from last uh, August, we, we actually built and opened up a small facility with 3D printer, laser cutter, uh, you know, the, you know, the drill, that that kind of stuff. Well, as I was starting, as I was agitating to get that going, I ran into another friend at a local high school who was having the same idea. So we banded together and we created something broadly called Vermont Fab Lab which is actually now two facilities, one at, at, uh, at this high school, one at the university. And while we were doing that, we found three other groups in our small communities that were doing the same thing. One had a more of a metalworking, one had more of an Arduino thing, one had a software bent, uh, the lab B. And all of a sudden, from thinking there was nothing, we were starting to see that there was a community. And then I saw an announcement um, Jen and, and what some group called Vermont Makers was bringing one of my heroes, K uh, Casey Reese, who wrote Processing, and I'm a big uh, uh, Arduino junkie. I, I think everybody there is. And they, they were bringing Casey Reese in, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go and get all of my programming questions answered, and I'll be able to learn all of this. I walked in, and there were there were artists. There were women. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was like what? Uh, and from there, it's just been an amazing year because our community, it's, it, it brings in the, 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 well, I don't want to, I think everybody's a nerd in the group, but when I think about the hardcore engineering people that, that my posse represents, and it's not just IBM, there's a large IBM facility here, but we've been able to pull from that, from artistic people, musicians, uh, museum people, university people, it just keeps growing. We had our first maker fair this summer. We expected 500 people. We had almost 1,700 people. And so it just is growing. It's actually, when we, we should talk about it later, it's, it's almost growing too fast. We can't even keep up with it. But anyway, that's my connection. That's my history. I think you forgot the flamethrowers. Flamethrowers. Yeah. <laughs> actually, if you want to see about the TV show, I, the TV show is really dumb, but there's a lot of stuff out there. It's called The Colony. And um, and there's we built flamethrowers and radios out of garbage. It was really that that part. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I should say a few words about myself too. I, I'm also at IBM, and I'm sort of an innovation evangelist for big uh, industrial customers in Sweden, and I'm also a contact person for IBM Research in Sweden. Uh, do technical. Uh, speeches and, and stuff and, and technical sp spokesperson in the press and so on um, and um, apart from being an engineer I also uh, make music and write lyrics and stuff so I'm, I'm actually sitting in my studio and that's why there's a lava lamp up there because no studio is complete without a lava lamp that's right <laughs> uh, and um, um, I, 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 there is actually apart from all the personal interest stuff in, in, in these kind of communities and so on there is actually a, a, a professional reason to be involved in this too, because uh, we've we've actually run these kind of maker-like or rapid prototyping sessions with big customers uh, because they they actually need to learn to play a bit more and do quick stuff. Don't we know it? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Michael, I want you to know I have five lava lamps. Just that's good. <laughs> okay, guys, why you fly with your lava lamps? I actually think, you know, we're a quarter late. Do you mind that we go a quarter over so we keep the session uh, a quarter longer? Is that okay for everybody? Sure, yeah. Yes. John, you, are you okay with this? Yeah. 
Yeah, and so is Michael. <laughs> Fine, because then I actually want you guys to, anyone who wants, come up and say hi so they know who you are. Say your name and your passion. When you come back to sit, if you sit here, they can actually see you on the camera. Because else, everybody who's from here, they can't see, and I think that's a shame. So everybody come up and say hi. State your name and your passion, and sit down again. Henrik, they know you, but you can be the first. Hi, hi guys. Hi. 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 I know you all, but Jen, we've only been ten. Yes. Days. Hello. Hey. hey, Henrik. Hi. I have never seen you with like a full body and legs. <laughs> well, I got, I got two of them. Um, no, no, I went in here to Malmo because I know it would be some uh, technical issues with uh, Google Plus and so on, and uh, but that's ah. fixed now. So nice to see you guys. You nice. too. Nice to see you, Henrik. Hi, you my name is Jenny. I'm from Hyper Island, and my passion is stupid questions. Oh, nice great. to see you. <laughs> you got the question. No, not right now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Hi. Felicia, and I'm a student at Hyper Island as well, and I'm just interested in people and different perspectives. I'm very curious. Great. Nice to meet you. John and Jen, do you know Hyper Island? Hyper Island? Yes. You need to no, Google it. Mm -hmm. You need to Google it. Office. Google it. Okay. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi. I kind of love you guys already. My <laughs> name is Maya, and my passion is digital art. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Uh, hi. <laughs> my, uh, hi. <laughs> my name is Karin Riding. Uh, I'm a game designer. I have a company called Osma Games. Uh, and my passion is to investigate uh, playfulness in different ways. Great, nice to meet you. Now we got another other thing to Google, and that's We Project, right? How, right. how do you spell that? The we Project. Oh no, the that's the name of the company. No. We what was Pro the name of her company? Osma. The game. O Z M A. Okay. Okay. Wait, did you get that, Jen? I think so. Hello, you guys. Uh, my Hi. Name, my name is Ole. It's really amazing seeing you. It looks like you have the best time. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, I think my passion is like doing silly creativity and uh, just diving deep into that thing. Yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah. It's great to meet you. You too. Hello, I'm the teacher to the previous guy. My name is... Hey! My name is David. Hey, John. Hey, David. John, look How at this. You? I'm wearing a tie. Don't get used to this, man. I'm uh, wearing <laughs> Um, I have to say about the previous guy, you didn't see this, but his t-shirt is matching his hat. This is very wow. important. <laughs> that's good. Hey, uh, uh, Jen, that's David from Arduino David. Oh. We've got wow, to get Arduino to David. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Sarah. Uh, I'm from Iran, and I'm a student in media software design. And I'm passion, my passion is uh, UI design. Excellent. Yeah. Great to meet you. Nice to meet yeah, you. Too. Bye. Hey, hey. Um, I'm Mariana Nikova, uh, computer engineer and um, teaching assistant in Mamel Hochschule. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Hello there. I'm Tomas Diaz. I'm an urbanist who plays with digital fabrication, and uh, my passion is to open, is open fab labs in the world. I run the Fab Lab Barcelona. Excellent. Great to meet you. We could learn something from him, probably, John. Uh, hi, I'm Jop, and I'm studying interaction design here, and I'm just one of those nerds who likes to learn about everything. So play with everything Excellent. <laughs> Great to meet you. Uh, hi, my name is Kiran. I'm from India. I um, accidentally met uh, some interesting people here uh, in Arduino field. And I want to take this information to my country and uh, share that knowledge to everyone there because in India and China, there is a lot of scope for Arduino. So I'm looking forward to it. Nice meeting you. Excellent. Great to meet you. Hi, I'm Keisha. Hi. I'm an interaction design student here in Malmahag School. And uh, well, my passion is, uh, I think, service design. But as everybody else has said, but I'm a curious person and love creativity. Yeah. 
Excellent. Great to meet you. Hi guys, my name is Andreas. Uh, I'm originally from the Bay Area, but I live in Copenhagen now. And I, oh, wow. uh, shame of all shames, my passion is analog photography. Wow. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. But I'm really interested in all this stuff. It's very cool. <laughs> Great to meet you. Hi there. I, my name Hi. is Karen. Uh, and I'm, uh, my passion is people and art. And I'm just here to, to see what what this is. Um, came here with Andreas, and uh, I'm very interested to hear what, what is going to be going on. Thanks. Great. Great to meet you. Hi. My name is Charlotte Ostlund. I'm a sociologist, and my passion is, uh, uh, my passion is science and art. Great. Nice to meet you. Hi there. That was too Hi. loud, even for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tiffany St. James. I've been one of the government's digital strategists in the UK for the last decade. We launched data.gov.uk. My passion wow. is helping to teach uh, kids how to code. And um, I've been speaking here about the work of uh, Rewired State, the largest young hackathons in the UK. I'm delighted to meet you guys. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to meet you too. I think we got about 16 more people that are a bit too shy to stand up. But we okay. move the camera a bit, so I think yeah, we're about 30 people in the room. Now, guys, it goes like this, that I ask Jen and John some questions, and sometimes Michael also comes with a wise perspective. But actually, we really would like you to be active. So while Jen and John just start talking, if you've got a question, up with your hand, because we actually want a conversation. Uh, we've, uh, lost ju just, we've lost John, and, I, and oh. I'm trying to reach him through different channels here, and I <laughs> can't. So I actually asked Jen about the <laughs> Makers Movement story, kind of the short story. You told a little bit, but can you explain to us what is this movement? What does it yeah, mean? Yeah, and I, and I have some slides too, so that might be the best way to go through it. Does that sound good? Yes. Can we get the lights down a bit? Okay. And we hope Jen will turn up. Okay, Jen, we can actually, it's, it's quite a nice, yeah. So you just kind of okay. that works. Guys, you we are actually it? prototyping this because we never done it through a Google Hangout and Skype just blocked a screen share unless you pay them. So now we everybody's going right. to, to Google Hangout. Yeah, you know, actually we've been using Google Hangout even within our group. Because like John was saying, we're we are a rural state. I mean, Burlington is a is a great little city and we can all get to Burlington, but it we just did it, but we're all maybe you know, either we live in Burlington or 20 to 40 minutes out from Burlington. So we've been using Google Hangout to meet, which is yeah, great because our, our core group is six people. Yeah. So I'll go through these slides um, and I guess just uh, let me know if I should stop at any point. And I'm uh, okay. Jen, just so you know, I'm looking for questions. The audience, so if anybody comes up with a hand, then I just okay. tell you, oh, we got a question or a comment or whatever. Yeah. Okay, start. great. So like we were talking, um, one of our first events that we did with Vermont Makers and Champlain College and also um, with a local organization in town called Burlington City Arts is that Casey Reese had come, who was in Burlington and he was, uh, had an exhibition at a local um, city run gallery uh, and also was giving a talk at Champlain College. And so Vermont Makers came in as a sponsor of this event and it was our first public event and it was, sort of the perfect beginning really because we were coming together as an Arduino user group and here was someone who had um, helped create processing. This is a piece of his work. Um, so we really, and just to back up a little bit, it was in late 2011 that this group started to form. So this event with Casey Reese, I believe was in uh, March or April. Um, yeah. yeah, so you're good. I'm gonna sort of bring you through a bunch of sort of things that started identifying us as a group and the things we would do in the community. So one of the next relationships we started to build up was with Spark Fun Electronics. Um, they're in Colorado. Are you guys familiar with them as no, a supplier? I think supplier? you just have to, to uh, very short stated who they are. Okay, okay. So they're in a, they are an uh, electronics company in Colorado. They're, they're about 10 years old, I believe. Um, and they sell the Arduino and they also sell a lot of different other kinds of kits too around, um, you know, 
just creating all sorts of different stuff. But they're at spark, they're sparkfun.com. They have started an educational outreach program. So this is Jeff, he works for their company, but he actually travels around the country. We're one of his regions and he'll, they'll do these workshops that are um, free. Um, and they're, they take a train the trainer approach in the sense of training people to be able to train other people. And so this is him. Um, and then, and now this is us. That's our, um, one of our core members, Eric there. And he is talking to a couple of librarians. He's teaching them, this is within a workshop and he's teaching them basic Arduino. Um, and we had used that initial workshop with Jeff to sort of get a sense of sort of some best practices around teaching. Um, now here we are in, uh, in our other core member, Rebecca Schwartz. We're in her studio. And we are helping her test this installation piece she's built called the Tower of Power, which is using um, basically bi three bicycles to power this tower of light. Um, and this was great coming together because she had built this in her MFA program and it hadn't really worked quite right for a while, but Eric as an engineer um, and a came and helped her sort of figure out what was going on. And then as a group, small group, we came together to test it. Um, and then we then took this to another event where we worked with some teachers and just showed them the possibilities of working with microcontrollers and this sort of merging of art sense and technology where we did live demos of different projects just for a small group of teachers. So this is a cappuccino and an Arduino. <laughs> And um, now I get it. Now I get it. <laughs> and this is um this was actually came this just sort of composite photo came out of me talking with a local cafe um, in town and trying to figure out ways where we might be able to do some programming together. Um, you know the idea because initially when I was my you know, it was really looking at some different contemporary art movements where you had different kinds of thinkers coming together that informed really wonderful art. Um, that was part of the inspiration for me around Vermont makers. So this idea of having sort of a cafe gathering space was really appealing. Um, and just so this, this relationship is still evolving. We actually haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, and we are finding that the university space that, well, that we have with Champlain College is pretty wonderful because it's it's much easier to get a quiet room. So we've been breaking up some of our events where if we're really talking about a book or doing a workshop, the, the college university space works great, but then maybe we go out after. I like the cappuccino. The cappuccino. <laughs> um, now this is at an event called the Art Hop, which is like a street art festival that happens in Burlington. And this is actually one of John's inventions here. And this is a great event to really interact with the public around um, accessible art. And we were out in a little park here and we had several projects. Um, and this project obviously got really exciting at night. And John, why don't you talk about okay. this a little? So uh, one of the things that actually has been fun is we, uh, we have a small core group of people here who are working with this kind of computer controlled lights. This is this hula hoop. Um, I actually now know that a couple of companies like Helix are actually making commercial products, but this is just the, uh, these are uh, LED light strips uh, inside here. There's a little SPI bus run uh, flexible circuit board with about 30 LEDs per meter. And I said, well, gosh, you should be able to hook that into, just like with that hat, you know, you should be able to hook it into a, 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 a hula hoop. So I've been building these hoops and taking them to music festivals for the last year just for fun. But um, we, we had this out at the art hop and it was just, there was just a line for it. This actually is a, the daughter, that's Jada, um, uh, uh, one of uh, John um, Mangan's uh, daughter. She's tiny, you know, she's under three feet tall, but she could just whip this thing around. And what, what's really fun to do is that we actually have some interaction. People will be using it and then we'll go back and we'll rewrite software for the blinking patterns. And, you can do some amazing things, but it was really fun going back to the, you know, how do you uh, interact with the community? This art hop has been going on for, I don't know how many years, Jen, many years, right? Yeah. Maybe but 15. Th there, there has always been kind of a, a slightly techie component to it, but this year having the Vermont makers there, it was so fun to engage with the public. And there was so much latent interest in do it yourself, art meets technology here. It was, it was really, really fun. And I, I mean, I, I can't wait for next year in that event. 
Yeah. And one thing we got to do at this, the art hop was about three weeks or four weeks before our first maker fair. And so it was an opportunity to really talk to people about it. And earlier in the summer, we had had um, a new, there had been a newspaper article about what we were doing in the, um, in the weekly, in the arts and news weekly here. So it was sort of, we were starting to get this building of people sort of getting a sense of what we were doing and getting interested in that. And, it, and, and, and at the same time, like, remember, we're a group of six, our core group is six people. It's totally volunteer. There's absolutely no funding. <laughs> but, but I should say, hey, Jen, you, when you say core group of six people, those are the six, those are the people, you know, the core of us who actually organize it. I think our meetups are getting, what, 70 people, something like yeah, that? Right. It, yeah, right. And then my point being that it's just sort of a small, very um, inspired group of people that are sort of are the ones who are going to these events and it's sort of yeah it's all right. out of a real passion for what is going on but it's infectious and the idea is that we're sort of these we're we're if anything a conduit we're not trying to control it or dictate it or we right. don't even have membership Jenny? it's just getting that word out there yeah, and i just want to ask you too uh john and jen you're very different from very different backgrounds professions what mm -hmm. drove you to this? What is the motivation? You nearly said it, but I promised to ask. So what's the, what's the motivation uh, for being part of the Makers Movement? Well, I can just say for me, they usually have free food at the events, and that draws me <laughs> in. We don't. Oh, yeah, you don't. How, well, I'm, I'm done then. <laughs> uh, you know, there's so many things, I think, um, that it's even hard to answer that question. I, I really think. I guess that the core for a core of it for me is that this place, the common ground of exploration mm. across disciplines, is a really such a a wonderful way to meet people and talk with people and uh, collaborate with other people. Um, you know, and as an artist, that's just been so central to my interest, you know, art as an exploration and my whole education is around that and to really bring attention to that place of exploration. Um, and there's so much inspiration there and there's so much optimism too. I mean, it's been a rough decade. Um, and I think being, being on the East Coast in particular and in Vermont, you know, we're very politically progressive and um, we're close to Washington and there's quite a bit of cynicism um, and the opportunity I had to be in the Bay Area where invention was of so, so such a part of everyday conversation and to tap into that optimism. Um, I just got this whole appreciation for it and it's been so exciting to see that there. And I think that is really it. There's just there's just so much optimism in it. And for, for us, uh, I mean, I, I can't speak for engineers as a group, but you know, I think there it's it's similar, but it's coming from such a different point. But towards the towards exactly what Jen was saying, um, you know, over the last two decades, last 20 years, engineering uh, enrollment in, in in this country and in Western Europe is actually declined about by about 15 percent. And so it you know, it's not that I wanted to make everybody into engineers, but it does you know, something that I love so much, just like somebody loves music or poetry or art, you know, you, you want to share that passion. And I, I have been working very hard for the last 20 years trying to, you know, go in. I do a lot of work in schools with high voltage and stuff like that. I, but it's only through the, the, the sort of resurgence of the maker movement in the last, I'd say maybe only five years, maybe even less. It's, it's most notable in the last three years that instead of having to push it, we've been able to, we've been getting pulled. The, you know, the kids and the teachers and the parents are kind of excited about technology and, 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 and doing it themselves, et cetera. So when I see a community that actually uh, engages the public and not necessarily, you know, trying to change their career choices, but allows them to, you know, get the pure enjoyment out of cool, t cool technology and get that interaction. It just makes me feel so good. It's it's something that I've wanted my entire life, and I think through a, a really wonderful convergence of, uh, you know, that th is the makers movement of, you know, the the collaborative kind of mashup stuff that happens online, uh, the componentization, the open source movement, uh, nice people. I think that's only been recently invented. 
I don't know what it is, but it's, you know, it's so wonderful to actually have that, that really genuine interest from kids and their parents and teachers, just the general public. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time um, in, in the fully industrial part of, of, you know, the technology movement. And I think that engineers uh, and, and scientists sometimes get a bad rap of not, not being into the people part of things. But I, I have found it, I don't know about you, Jen, but I found it so wonderful to get our nerd, you know, our, our geeky people from engineering companies, you know, people like I bring from IBM or Eric brings, uh, you know, and, and get them interacting with artists. I mean, you know, in, in the old days, it's, you know, engineers were never known for being really social people. You know, especially Swedish engineers. You know, but I've I've been over. There. <laughs> Do you, um, but it's been a wonderful blending of these cultures, and it's been so natural. You know, when I think about yeah. some of the proposals we're doing, how people are coming together, and I'm going. You know, uh, the, we were just joking around John, before John. this uh, this uh, conference uh, this morning. We we had to get in there and, and write some proposals for some pieces of art that uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. And you know, I'm coming at it like a lab report, and. Uh, you know, the artists are coming at it like with a, you know, a artistic psychological thing. And it's really interesting, you know, when you're trying to work with somebody else and you bring your work together and you, it really, it really opened me up to the artistic way of thinking, even though I'm not artistic. Hey, let me just throw in one factoid. Do you know, Sweden, do, do you know that uh, what country in the world has the highest percentage of, of engineering graduates for, for all graduates? Sweden. North Korea, North Korea was a question. Sweden. North Korea, no? Sweden. Sweden has more electrical, more engineering graduates per thousand than any other, uh, you know, uh, not uh, not not in total numbers, but in percentages. I you know, you would think it would about... be India or China, but they have so many more people. It's just a concentration thing. But in my mm -hmm. when I was doing some research for this, that was of about three years ago. Uh, Sweden was the one. There you are. Amazing. So we actually have the potential for a huge makers movement. As long as we get no, all these engineers in with women and free food. Uh, I, we have a question from the audience. Sure. Uh, could you also say that it might be uh, liberating for engineers? Because I can imagine that you, you just said yourself, you've been working so much with industrial and business end of the uh, industry, that you only got the opportunity to work there in the first place. And this, this maker movement gives you the opportunity to be social and more artistic. I, I, could, I, I, I could only, I, I couldn't hear the um, most important well, parts you, of you mentioned that yourself that... that uh, the, you've been working for a long time more on the industrial side and the business side and that engineers get the accusation that they only do that. But could you also say it's a chicken and egg problem that you only get the chance to do that in the first place and that this is a kind of liberating movement I for you? So, I think so. I, I think uh, it's not that you, I wouldn't have had a chance, but it would be a whole lot less likely. I actually have done a fair bit of uh, arts. I've, I work for, uh, I, I tend to work for musicians doing uh, art pieces for them, but I would say for my more general community, it was, you know, while the opportunities might have been there before, there's so much, there's so much more uh, plentiful now, but even better because of the maker movement, it's so much easier to act on an idea. You know, again, uh, kudos to David and his colleagues with the Arduino, but, you know, in the old days when I was using, you know, pick microcontrollers and stuff like that, it was just such a headache to start from scratch on everything. Now, you know, you pick up a, 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 an open source microcontroller, you use some open source code on it, you take somebody's idea, like well, th this, uh, this LED strip stuff is a perfect example. Um, I started importing this from China about four years ago. Um, it had really poor documentation. I, I worked out some of the SPI code. I got, got stuck, stuck a question out on the web. A guy named Xander Hudson uh, took my code and figured out the, the last bits with the PWM. Uh, that code then got, so we rewrote it as Arduino because it was coming up. And then someone at, at, uh, at Ada Fruit Labs uh, sort of took that concept and they actually improved it way beyond what, uh, what I would have done. You know, that, you know and, and, and now that, this code is, is their code. This, this code is based on the Lady Ada code. And it's kind of like, you know, I, I and probably 20 other people contributed to it. That, that kind of thing would never have happened in straight industry, you know, where you take your ideas and you hold them very close to yourself. And actually, I think, as Michael said, one of the things as that's interesting to me as an industrial guy is how do we bring this free spirit, this collaborative, you know, open kind of thinking into the industrial space? And that's something that Michael and I and Henrik uh, talk about on a fair bit.
uh, have the same problem in the narrative field. My background is the film business, and we don't dare talk about our ideas because someone might steal our story. So we have kind of a <laughs> similar problem. How do we do an open process, both with audience and ourselves? But I was thinking, uh, Jen, you got a couple of pictures down there, and Jen, you also mentioned a proposal. So I think yeah. uh, maybe we should see a bit more of your examples, and then the guy's actually going to tell you about the latest proposal that they just done uh, and get your feedback. But Jen, do you want to show some yeah, uh, pictures I before? Yes, I'd love to. So this image that you see here, this is of the coach barn at Shelburne Farms. And this is where we had our maker fair. Um, and this is a very special place in Vermont, obviously. And um, it was this great opportunity to immediately bring in some Vermont character into the event. Um, the other maker affairs I've been to in the States, which is in San Mateo, and that, well, actually went to one in Canada and Montreal. They do tend to be in these big lots or, um, you know, conference center areas. And so the ours was actually happening where there was grass and mountain views and water it was very appropriate for the culture of our state. Um, it also allowed us to have some, um, there were catapults at ours um, that were launching pumpkins into the lake. <laughs> <laughs> which was pretty fun. Um, and it and it potentially was gonna give us the the space to do some really um, interesting demos with rockets and um, some quadcopters. Um, unfortunately, the weather was not that great the day of the event, um, but it does look like we're gonna continue them here. Here's another picture. This is another part of the farm. Yeah, you know, conference centers and launching catapults and rockets, they know it's, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. Yeah, right. <laughs> actually, Vermont has that kind of slight bit of craziness. But you know what, Jen, I sometimes think if the weather had been good, you know, we got almost three times more people than we expected. If the weather had been good, we would have been in trouble, I think. We, we might have had to turn people away. We weren't really prepared for that many people, and that would have definitely been a bummer. So this uh, is actually, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, indoors you don't launch uh, pumpkins, you launch potatoes, right, John? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so this is so it was indoors and outdoors, and this is um, outdoors under a tent. This is one of our booths. We had two booths next to each other. This one was paper airplanes and paper helicopters. So it was a project you could teach. It was a really neat little thing you ended up with. Um, and it could be taught to and, and people of all ages really quickly. But it was, it was right next to um, uh, our friends here, Steve and Ed, who have built an AeroQuad uh, quadcopter. And so they were there. We, Unfortunately, didn't get to do like the flight demos, like I was saying, so much because it was rainy. But they were there to show everything behind making one, the software, the hardware. Um, their the way they had approached their project was really interesting because they had used um, because they are inventors, and Ed had a lot of this equipment to begin with. But then Steve is the software guy to sort of bring some old and new um, technology together and really made it their own thing. Here are the catapults. They were amazing. They were, uh, I mean, one of them, it was just unthinkably amazing. Yeah, I like to see this guy with his little hat. I mean, it was, it was the most, it was so exciting. It, I can only explain it, like, because it would, it flung the pumpkin so far. And people were just amazed. It's like you held your breath through the whole thing. We, yeah. And then it exploded on the lake. It, it was, was like, it was not, like yeah. five times longer hang time than you would, you know, you expect it to go, psh, plunk. But it would just, it was like, I was almost a minute. It was like, it was going to go to New York. I know. It was, um, this is a project here. This was a, a combination of a, of a teacher, um, Bev Ball, actually, who is uh, the wife of, of Jeff Branson from Spark Fun. And she teaches a lot of, diff she really teaches electronics in these very innovative ways. She works with different kinds of learners and um, just different, lots of different kinds of kids. And so she had developed this project where she made, we have a, a mythological sea um, monster in our lake called Champ. And so she had built this sort of paper mache champ. And what you can't see here is there was this whole body to it that was fabric and they used um, and they and they built the whole uh, body um, and decorated it with LEDs. So kids got to learn sort of very basics um, in terms of circuits while they were creating this craft project. 
Um, the other kind of programming we do is we do our meetups, which are for about four times a year on different themes. And this is, and they're really based on live demos and bringing people from the community in to do these live demos. And this is one that John hosted um, on high voltage. And John, I'll go through, I've got three slides here, but if you wanna just briefly talk about it. So um, it was fun because we had, most of our meetups had been more on the art side. And you know, there, uh, I have a small cadre of friends that do high voltage as a hobby. And high voltage is a really kind of an interesting, we were, it was just quite an interesting experiment because we didn't know how appealing this would be to the general public. Um, and high voltage is funny because you can do everything from making you know, little static pops using things like soda bottles to things that you would read about on the front page if they went wrong. Like the thing that my friend Colin is standing behind, that's my most dangerous device, that's a Marx generator. It creates a 625,000 volt spark, which is dangerous and, uh, well, I should say it creates a 625,000 volt almost meter long spark, but you can actually do it from four pen light batteries a couple of times. But the, the real danger, it, it's, it's very dangerous by itself, but what happens is it's such a high current when it all discharges that it, it wrecks electronic equipment. I've destroyed two cell phones, a wireless phone, garage door opener, alarm clock, and a washing machine with this thing. But uh, it was still pretty fun. We just had to make sure that nobody with a uh, uh, pacemaker was anywhere near it. But what was really fun for me was bringing together uh, a group of people. These were all all, all uh, people that had some sort of high voltage habits. Uh, we had father and, 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 and kid teams. Uh, we had um, some really sophisticated people like uh, my friend uh, uh, Scott and um, uh, Dave Hammond from the university. We had, you know, for example, we had really, really high end power stuff. Like I brought some big Tesla coils. Uh, my friend Dave brought a device that used high current to explode, you know, to cut in half and explode a soda can. Um, and, and on the other end of the spectrum, we had uh, simple devices that you could actually build in schools uh, that we have a program at IBM for going in. What was really interesting, we got off to a slow start because where it was where it was placed was hard to park. But by the end, I think we had about 70 people there. Is that right, Jen? Yeah, we're averaging about 70 people for these events. And right now, they're, it's very much word of mouth. We don't do any public listings. And, um, yeah, this and, was all really yeah. social networking was, was getting in there. You know, and I think we had... Uh, what was great is because we got late start and, and I was supposed to curate the show, but I didn't know that curation actually meant take things off the list. So we had a ton of stuff. We had a really comprehensive thing organized from, you know, electrostatics to induction to high current. And we had so much stuff and people stayed through it. But what was so fascinating is even late at night when it was over, the people came up to the stage and started talking and we've got some collaborations that are going from that night, we have a we have a piece that's kind of uh, knocking around in our heads about a uh, uh, sol uh, wind powered uh, electrostatic generator, which is kind of interesting. And uh, Scott and myself and Scott and uh, have been approached by a couple of people who actually want to build Tesla coils. So what was so cool is to walk away from that thing and actually have new relationships formed and new projects coming out of it. And no one with a pacemaker who died. We have a question. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, just curious uh, about your. Um, you said it was dangerous. Is is that what people call the EMP charge? Yeah, it's exactly. It's an EMP. It's about as <laughs> well. I, I uh, Scott and I built this a few years ago, thinking that would be a great in-school demo, <laughs> and, and uh, I remember testing it downstairs in my house. I have a very large old house, and when it fired, the wash machine, the clothes washer upstairs. All of a sudden, I, I don't know, things turned on at the same time that weren't supposed to turn on. It almost leapt off the floor. It just went, you know, I'm downstairs. The thing is just, you know, I, I'm not doing its thing upstairs. This thing fired. The thing went boom, 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 boom. I thought, mm, better not do it in classrooms. But somehow I felt motivated. <laughs> uh, we only ran it at a fraction of its power that night. But, you know, you got to take some chances. Okay, Jen, we're right. back to All you. Right. Yeah, we so have a, we have a word at, uh, at, at Burning Man. Uh, they always say, safe, remember, safety third. <laughs> if people that didn't is... hear, safety third. So what are the first two ones, John? If, if safety is the third. 
It doesn't matter. Okay, fine. But if you look, if you read, look up safety third, you'll see Burning Man. Yeah, there's actually a friend of mine who's made some buttons around that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, on John's point, too, I can segue into some of these other things, and then we'll get right to those new proposals uh, that Asta mentioned. But the that there's a lot that these these projects do involve a lot of experimentation. And for those of us who are involved with it, you know, that's half the fun, right? And to have sort of, we had a lot of commitments in different events. Um, a, many, of, a couple, many of our projects evolved throughout those events. So it was like, you know, sort of the, you'd be working on a project and then we would show it to the public and it would be at a certain phase. And then you would learn things about your project, not just through the public's interaction because certain things would work, certain things wouldn't work. People would respond to things differently. Um, and one of these projects has been, a, is, is really trying, looking at the weather balloon um, and not just the electronics of the weather balloon, but the science and also the potential for the public art part of this. And that if, like, for example, what's happening here is uh, the project has totally failed in terms of what we wanted it to do. Um, you know, for this project, we wanted the balloon to be really high this day. It was still going to be tethered and it should be lifting the sort of small unit you see on the bottom. But there's a helium shortage here. Um, and that presented challenges in terms of getting good quality helium. It was a windy day, and so we couldn't tether the balloon that high um, and had to bring it into shelter. And just sort of through, this was for a tech event that was happening within, within inside this building here. Um, and then I have this sort of crazy suitcase that I, you know, bring different things to events, to events on. So we just sort of put the whole thing together. And so this visual started creating a lot of attention because you know, weather balloons are not a new technology, but most people, and especially kids, have never seen a weather balloon before. So it's something that it started to create its own, build its own audience. You know, people who would see it and be like, whoa, what is that? And then, I mean, they obviously know it's a balloon, but it's like, oh, it's a weather balloon. And then you, what's a weather balloon? Like, how do they use weather balloons? And, um, and from there, we had great conversations with people and talked about the helium shortage and, and talked about where the project was going and talked about that potential, um, you know, for the people who came to it and already knew what it was of, of the potential of like, isn't this kind of cool that everyone is really drawn to this weather balloon? So this was the second time we did this project because we also did it at Maker Fair, but it's still an ongoing thing and we're really, um, we're actively exploring and bringing different people in um, from the technology, from the arts and from the sciences to, ex to experiment, to try to really figure out how we can use this as a platform to introduce people to, to this place, this merging place. Um, the quadcopter, which I showed you earlier at Maker Fair, which didn't fly, was finally able to fly at this event because the conditions were correct. So this is another project that we've been able to show the, its progress. And at one of our first meetups, this wasn't flying yet at all. Like they hadn't gotten it flying yet at all, but they, ta they were talking about their process. So there's this real raw element and this very down to earth element to how we're presenting. Um, and so now I can finally go into these new proposals. <laughs> okay. So we were invited as a group to participate, to submit proposals for um, installations that would be happening at this gallery. This is the Burlington City Arts Center. And they were looking for interactive installations in sound and light. And um, John has proposed one with a team uh, mainly around light and I've proposed one around sound. And so John, why don't you explain yours? Cause- Yeah, okay. And the demo, right, you're going to, go ahead. Okay, no, I was going to say, we're going to see if we can actually get them to interact. So the, the, uh, the Burlington Center Art, uh, City Arts has a, a, a gallery called the Burlington Firehouse Gallery, which That's coincidentally right. was a firehouse. So it's actually a really cool building. Uh, you know, it's this tall, uh, long, skinny building. At the top, there's this really cool tower. And, oh, you're, you'll talk about the tower in the building. Um, yeah, I can show the, a picture right here. There's the tower. Yeah, one of the There's crazy the architectural, that's a, it's a really great place to be. Uh, one of the, the crazy architectural features, go ahead and flip the screen there. To, yeah, one of the interesting architectural features as you walk in, there's a glass face, a glass uh, front of the building facing what is called Church Street, which is the main, it's a walking uh, um, district in the city of Burlington, very 
trendy, you know, it's where it's all the hip people hang out. And uh, this glass, this large glass front, you enter the museum and right as you enter there, are, for some reason, somebody thought to put glass bricks in the floor. So there's a, a pattern of uh, uh, seven, seven rows, uh, 21 columns, if you can imagine, of glass bricks that are about, uh, you know, maybe 17 centimeters on a side. They're fairly large and they're translucent, but they weren't used for anything. As a matter of fact, they're covered up. Some of them are covered up with a mat. And anyway, so what we're proposing for this interactive piece is something we're calling uh, Flourish, you know, F-L-O-O-R-I-S-H. And it's a collaboration between myself, uh, one of the UVM students that I, uh, I mentored, uh, Colin Bremstead, uh, Ken Howell, who's a uh, assistant professor at Champlain College, and uh, my son Max, who is a, a, a art and design uh, a graduate from Pratt, uh, Pratt University in New York, who does physical computing. So the idea is is to actually the 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 the, pan, uh, the light bricks are actually accessible underneath in the basement. Uh, they're 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 set in these kind of cement um, matrix. And what we're going to do is we're going to put these very bright four LED light uh, LED matrix uh, pixels under each of them. And then we're going to be using uh, some uh, mix of, of the Arduino Teensy, just basically as an SPI uh, 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 interface to the, to the light strips. And then running on a computer, we're going to be running processing and, and using some software that we developed for a, a project, a different project, a light wall project. Uh, that uh, uses some of the componentry that I mentioned from Lady Ada, um, we're going to create a, a little interactive display where uh, when no one is standing on it, the thing will go through, you know, various washes, a bit like this, uh, this uh, hula hoop, you know, it's just going to go doing kind of slow, not too gaudy, but some, some appealing struck, uh, you know, uh, light patterns, which will, by the way, be also visible from the street. So we hope that it'll bring people in. But we've been working a lot with the Microsoft Connect and you see up there in the upper left, um, we, our light wall uh, uh, device that we built for the local uh, local Echo Museum as a prototype. Um, we've gotten pretty good at being able to sense position and loc you know location and and stance of people. Now up to six people we can we can track, and and be able to then turn that into light pattern. So the basic idea is that when when someone steps onto the to the glass bricks, they they uh, the, the pattern would respond and, and light up underneath the person or persons. And we're talking, we've got several interactive ideas where, you know, various people, you could either walk around and sort of sketch uh, at, with your feet. That would be one idea. Or alternately, we would actually have, uh, we, we've talked about having some sort of interaction that allows two people to get in there and, and even play like a game. So with the resolution of the, the connect, we believe that we will actually be able to allow people to kick a blob of light back and forth. But some of the some of the interesting parts of this will be exploring just what the limits of resolution are and how we place the sensor. So anyway, we're waiting to hear back on this. But, uh, you know, I'm very interested. Again, we're working. I'm working with two artists and one of whom is my son. I can't tell you how proud it is for me to, you know, have uh, you talk about a maker movement. I made him or a help. And uh, now <laughs> okay. do, we, do we have any feedback on the on the interactive light following your movements? And we have I have one more proposal to show. Yeah. If there's I just want to say yeah. that uh, when I look at this, I think about two things. I think about uh, the artist Camilla Utrabach, who painted her whole. Uh, she's she's a modern uh, abstract painter. And she filmed every stroke, and then the painting is on four walls in the room. And when you move, there are motion sensors um, in the, in the um, ceiling. So when you move, the painting gets done. And that's a very interesting interaction because actually it is done before, but you feel you get behind the work. And the other mm -hmm. thing I'm thinking about is something that the Swiss university is doing called double ganger, no. where you take a, a ball uh, that is just a light reflection. But you catch it and, and you throw it, and that gives you actually bodily feedback. Uh, that's through a west, and you probably don't want a west. But this kind can of having a thing that you can throw is extremely powerful whenever we use motion sensors. Can you, um, can you share that with me, Asta? Can you send me that? 
Most definitely, and they're really nice guys down there, very funny, so I can send you the contact. And the Camilla Utra back, I can just show, uh, send you some PowerPoint, you can get in touch with her. All right, that'd be yeah, awesome. Uh, that we've got a feedback more here. Yeah, just, just want to say that I have some friends on just other side of this wall that is working on a project that is more or less exactly this, so you that should talk awesome. to them. Okay, can you send me that? Uh, where Where is here? Are we at Malmo now, or where are we? Yes, we are. Okay, can you can you help connect me with those people? Yeah, um, I can go and catch them. Just give me a minute. Okay. Well, what we do is just you send an email, and you can send it to me, and I can send you further on to John and so on. Um, that would be awesome. No problem. I also want to say that the Danish Alexander Institute just won a Red Dot Award. For interactive flaws a couple of years back and last i worked with them they figured out some chinese spy cameras uh, which is a copy of the cias that can actually follow your shadow because most time when you have uh, webcams they cannot see who's who but if we can keep tracking a shadow then it keeps responding to you in a certain way and that's very wow. powerful oh that's interesting do you guys have you used the connect much um yeah but it's, pr it's problematic for uh, longer running solutions uh, there still hasn't been anyone who's been able to use it for many users where it doesn't break and doesn't take too much kind of um, running costs from the institution. Ah, uh, okay. Good to know. I love the connects, but I'm, I'm careful in using them. Uh, but small art museums would be a good place to do it. Yeah, this is only a one month uh, kind of install, so hopefully. But even there, I, 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 you know, we, our experience with them has been pretty good. But. If it's, if it's not a permanent, I wouldn't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jen, you had some more ideas? Yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, share with you an, a proposal that I made coming from more of the sound. So at the top of the fire, this building here, so here's the building. You can't, you can't see it, but at the, very, at the top, there's this 80-foot bell tower. And when we were, when they initially invited us and gave us a tour of the gallery um, for our proposals, what I discovered through talking with them is that, so the firehouse um, has gone, it was uh, 1889 is when it was built and it's gone through a bunch of different changes. Um, and it's been the BCA Center Gallery for about a decade. Um, the bell, so they, and they had to restore the whole building to turn it into the art center. Um, now, the Shelburne Museum, which is a, a local uh, museum, had been keeping the bell. And the, so the bell was only returned to the bell tower in 2002. However, they, they, so they had to have got all this funding to restore the bell tower so it could actually hold the bell because the bell is very heavy. But they didn't complete the funding. So the bell is not hanging and the bell has not rung since it was returned to the tower. So as a sound artist and someone who's done some research on sort of these um, iconic community sounds, for example, like the foghorns in San Francisco, this suddenly became very interesting to me because here is this bell that has not ever been sounded before. So there's this kind of mystery in there in terms of, well, what does this bell sound like? How was it used? Who used to ring it? Why was it rung? How did how would the community respond when it was rung? Um, and really looking at this bell as a, as a piece of communication technology because that's what it was. I mean, likely it was to alert people that there were fires, to alert the local fire department. Um, but a lot of this history around these kinds of older sounds is actually um, not very well documented, and you have to do a lot of research in terms of the public read. Uh, public record, letters to the editor, things like that. Um, thing, information tends to pop up when the technology has changed, when there's been a public response to a public sound changing. For example, in San Francisco, when I was researching the foghorns, the best information I could get was when, uh, whenever there was a change in the technology of the foghorns that changed the sound of the foghorns, there was usually some sort of public outcry documented through letters to the editor. So, you know, the most interesting point being here, I think the most important is that this is a, this install, this whole exhibition is supposed to be about interactive sound and light. And here is this piece of interactive sound technology, communication technology, just basically sitting up in this bell tower. 
Um, and it's so I've I've proposed a public art project and in the sense that it would explore the bell's aesthetic. So aesthetic meaning not just what it looks like, but what it sounds like. Um, any kind of way that that bell is sensed within a community and that and and the argument really to push forward that this is a public art project is if if the bell is an aesthetic interaction that then creates a public from it the public who hears that aesthetic interaction um, and it's also an opportunity to explore the unique relationships between sound sensing and architecture which i'm particularly interested in so the project has a research period to it to really look at what the history of the bell is. Um, but then there's also another part of it to be, to be that is like, well, if this bell is going to ring in 2013, what is a contemporary purpose for this bell to ring? Um, if you look throughout history, there are lots of different reasons why bells have rung. There were curfew bells, um, bells to let people know that um, the Romans did to let them know that the public baths were ready. And um, they were really used to notify a public. Well, so in an age of GPS and cell phones and all the technology we have, what would be a good purpose for this bell? So the project would explore that and it would, it would actually ask, start to ask the community in terms of what do you think is a contemporary purpose for this bell? Um, and at the very end of the project would hopefully be actually getting the funding in place for the bell to be rung again. And I think we, we uh, I think we have to wrap up because yeah. I think we went a bit over time and we also have a new lecture coming up. Okay. Uh, the guys who also work with um, kind of motion uh, interaction interfaces, you talked with them afterwards. So I just want to tell you, can you tell us some good advice if we want to do a make a creator space here in Malmo? What are your kind of, what are the barriers? What are the things we have to consider? In terms of a maker space, well, I can, I think John's had a little more experience with that than I have. I mean, really, my focus has not been on a space. I mean, my focus has been more about people, community and ideas and making sure we have the places to come together and actually looking at existing public spaces that can provide those kinds of resources. For example, Champlain College being able to um, give us a space to do public programming, being invited into other institutions like the Burlington Center Arts Gallery to actually participate on that level. Um, you know, from the Vermont, from the, from the very sort of core purpose of the Vermont makers, managing a space from is a is a really different task. And so it's not something I've looked into. And I know that we are, but I but I can tell you though that there's a huge demand here. I mean people are asking me about it all the time. And I was interested in the person who came earlier who's who seemed focused on being able to create these sort of shared um, maker spaces and fab labs, because we are running into issues here where some different fab labs are popping up, but then the public access part is really hard to, to create. I think, John, you said something about the key, that it had to be locked down sometime. If it was a university, people would have to lock the door yeah. now and then, and that was a problem. Actually, I, I was going to say something else was the key, but yes, I, I think, uh, you know, what I think what Jen and, and this Vermont Makers Group has helped me realize. So I started out coming at it from the Fab Lab perspective. And I feel good, you know, we've got two facilities that are now open, but they're, as Jen points out, it's, it's a little complicated to figure out, you know, who can have access to them and stuff. I mean, so far, anyone who wants to have access gets them, but it's through some special back channel. I think one of the one of the real uh, you know epiphanies that I've had uh, through through Vermont Makers and and Jen and 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 the other core members is that what's really important is the community. So the what what you'll actually find, um, I, I even found myself going, wait, you know, I'm I'm the one that's doing the group. When when uh, when the first other group approached me, I was like, oh, I've got to get mine open first, and then I went, it's not about that. It's about open. It's about you know the more the merrier. And I think what you know, we've actually had a little bit of you know tension in the community. There's one group that wants to have one facility that would be everything for all people, and you know what? That would be great. You know, I, we you couldn't have enough uh, capability. Well, I'm going to be careful. It, you know, the, I think the more the merrier. That said, is that in a, in a small area you are competing for 
uh, you know, there's a certain critical mass. And if you have a bunch of subcritical efforts, it won't work together. But I think in the spirit of openness, you just have to be open and let things work them, their way out. You have to be careful that you're not viewing it. You know, Asta, you made a point before in, in, in the arts. You know, if you're not careful, it's it becomes competitive. My idea, you know, it's not about my idea. It's about sharing. So I think one of the things is learning how to just be open to whatever. And, you know, somebody's going to donate some equipment, but they're going to put it over another facility. Great. The one thing. Yeah. So yeah. I've more. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say one interesting thing I read recently was that, you know, Staples, uh, do you know the chain there? They're going to be have they're going to have 3D printing available through their stores. So, I mean, the other thing to think about, too, is a lot of this technology is new now, but at some point it's going to be old. It's going to be mature. And I think there's going to be various types of things. I, I think there's great value in pooling your interest and skills. For example, at UVM, we're trying to buy a water jet, which is a very expensive, higher to maintain and dangerous piece of equipment that none of us, not my wife would never let me have it here. You know, that's not a good thing to have at home. But, you know, the idea of coming together collectively and, and, and sharing pieces of equipment, I think has a lot of merit. You know, what we're, again, it's trying to figure out how you can do that in the most inclusive way. What, what I, I've I've started now is to trying to build a network of complementary capabilities so that, you know, if we have a water jet and somebody else has a turning machine, for example, that's one of the things that we have, that we can actually share access to it. But to me, it's much more about the core community. And, no, you know, through this core community, I found it's easier to find people who might have the equipment or the know-how or the componentry or the connections uh, through that personal network rather than through some membership roster. So I think that the, the core of the, the, the people in that work, you know, keeping that live, nourishing that is gonna be more important than what, you know, what cap card lock door we can create that allows, you know, a certain subset of people to get in. I do think that having access to the equipment is very enabling. But you, I think uh, you just spoke up, you said that access to the equipment is enabling. Yep. Than I would have ever thought. I think that the key is you know, you're breaking up a but bit? I think it's sorry. You're breaking up a bit. Can you just repeat the last two sentences? I said that having access to equipment to rapid prototyping equipment is important, but it's secondary to having access to the community in my mind. And I'm a guy who uses those tools all the time. Maybe that's easy for me to say because I can I, any time of night I can go in and use that stuff. But I find that the intellectual collaboration is more valuable to me than the facility. But uh, I, that said, I, I think that every town should have at least a couple of these tools. I actually, you know, to be, I'll, I'll say something that's heretical. 3D printing is what gets all the hype. It's not as useful to me as the, like a 2D laser cutter or uh, a, mil a circuit board milling machine. You know, 3D printer, I use it about a tenth as much as I use those other tools. I'm Wonderful. curious, I'd love to share notes. We got a we email, got so Jenny, uh, Jen, would you like to have a last comment? Um, yeah, well, I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity, and I wish we could talk more. I wish I could be there and, and meet everyone and hear about what you're up to, but we are very, we are very interested in what you're doing, and I just, and, and, you know, and how you take this kind of knowledge you're getting from today and how you use it or how you sort of are spreading this energy or where you'd like to see things go. We'd be really interested in hearing about the kind of um, exciting things and also challenging things that you're running into. And I did just send through the chat a link to our website and our Facebook page. We're also on Google Plus and, and Twitter as well. Um, and um, and let us know what you're up to, links we should be following, how, how we can stay in touch, and maybe how we can continue this dialogue. I would love that. Most definitely. Yeah. I just have to say that uh, me and Jen and Jan have been talking about actually giving each other resources in the way of people. Um, David doesn't know yet, but maybe. David is a resource who wants to travel over there. If you need a, uh, someone to, to design interactive art experiences, I can come over. We got Mass, who's a brilliant artist, and we got a lot of people here in Malmö in the region. So we've been talking oh, about switching so resources. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't we that be like a, a sister cities program here? Exactly. Yeah. 
I so uh, I, I definitely want to look into that and figure out if we can get someone to support it. Not sure. Not yeah, sure. Perhaps we don't yes. know. We see. No. Huh? Yeah, I think the, the clothing, the winter clothing, would be exactly the same. You would feel very yeah. at home here in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Just need a flight ticket and some free food. <laughs> so uh, let's take one last question, and then there was the guys who just want to say hi to you. Um, so any last questions from the audience? Uh, Tiffany just asks. Sorry, just a very mundane question, but um, if you let us know your Twitter account out loud, I can put it on the hashtag for the event here, so everyone's got access. Oh, to it. okay. Let me make sure I get it right. I You know, it would, uh, Asta, this has been so much fun. It's kind of weird, you know, concentrating on just our perspective. We would love to be able to do the reverse and expose our community to you guys. I think we would probably learn more, much more. You're further along than this than we are. Um, I love this interchange, though. This has worked really well. I think if we look at what happens in the United States uh, compared to Europe, in Europe, we've been pretty advanced in educational gaming. And I think, for example, 10 years ago, we exported a lot, uh, especially to your... Um, different newspapers that were facing the convergence. And we also has done a lot in interactive art, but we haven't done so much and has created spaces where creators can meet. So I think, you know, you guys uh, have the long rope or the long end of how we make people stay together and do things. Uh, and But we had a lot of tests out over here, so we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, so we're very good at saying, you know, this can be really great and but I think, in general, we found out that it's all about the emotional experience. Before you build anything, it's about emotional connection. It's that's what we, connection. yeah, yeah. That's what we found out in transmedia storytelling, interactive, educational yeah. gaming. It's about emotions and connections, and from there, yeah. you can start the technology as a way to convey that. Hmm. Yep, that it's not the other way around. It never works the other way around. You know, the technology for the sake of technology. Great, guys. I'm uh, going to introduce you to the two guys in a second. So I just want to say, everybody, can we wave to John and Jen and say thanks for now? Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, we unfortunately have to end now. So if anyone want to come up and say hi while we turn on the lights and prepare for the next lecture, guys, if you just hang around for five more minutes or so. Sure. Yeah. Let me toss in a, a great thank you for, for arranging this, Asta. It's been Great, absolutely fantastic. We're just so happy to have you here. Thanks so much. Let's Thank give you. them a hand, by the way. We didn't do that. Let's back at you, too. <laughs> we need the. Uh, thank you. We got two uh, guys here working with interactive and movement. Hi there. Hey. Hello. How are you? Hey. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we're, we're Hi. We built a, a prototype where we we capture the light from uh, the IR uh, with the connected camera. Yeah, sorry. Um, um, and then we we place a light bulb in the, in the middle, and then we have an, uh, a camera, connect camera uh, in the ceiling, 